Good morning, everyone. I'm Sandy Ploden, and on behalf of CSUN Center on Disabilities, I would like to officially welcome you to the 36th annual CSUN Assistive Technology Conference. I want to sincerely thank all of you for joining us this year, and not just for supporting us, but also the community, presenters, sponsors, and exhibitors. It's been a challenging year for everyone, to say the least, in so many ways, and that makes all of us at CSUN appreciate your patience and cooperation even more. Switching gears from an on-site event to a virtual format, and sorry for some lame Star Trek paraphrasing here, was like exploring a new frontier. And while others have gone before that, before us, we did feel a little bit lost in space sometimes. And yes, we had a few detours, maybe a, more than a few, but we navigated through and now that our mission is almost complete, I really hope that our next destination is Anaheim. There's just nothing like being in person and on site. It's always our goal and number one priority to make the conference experience a successful and rewarding one. So again, we hope that this year, while different, meets this goal. I'm going to turn the program over to my boss in a minute, but I'll be popping back in before we conclude to give you a heads up and what's in store this week. So let me introduce you to Dr. William Watkins. Dr. Watkins is Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, a position he has held since June of 2010. He serves on the President's Cabinet and provides leadership to 11 departments and units in the Division of Student Affairs. He is an advocate and leader who seeks to ensure student access and accommodation, well being, ethical development, co-curricular engagement and degree attainment through equity-minded practices. Dr. Watkins is an alumnus of Cal State Northridge and while an undergraduate was elected student body president. He holds a master's degree in public administration from USC and a doctorate in education leadership from UCLA. So please join me in welcoming the COD supporter in chief, Dr. William Watkins. Thank you very much, uh, Sandy, for your kind introduction. I'm really excited to, to join everyone as we open up the 36th annual CSUN Assistive Technology Conference. Uh, this, this conference is, uh, is one of the marquee programs of the Division of Student Affairs here at Cal State University Northridge, which has been its administrative home ever since the conference was established under the marvelous leadership of Dr. Harry Murphy, uh, the founding director. Uh, and, and if Harry, if you're out there, we salute you and we, we say hello to you and we miss you. Uh, last year, uh, this uh, time, you know, we were really caught in quite an interesting situation as we were all pivoting, uh, pretty much so during this very month as we were launching the conference down in Anaheim, as Sandy has referenced before, while things were shifting and changing all around us. And so if any of you know uh, Sandy like I know Sandy, you can imagine just what kind of a challenge it was for her to try to offer an experience uh, for those of you who had registered with us uh, while things were pivoting to a virtual environment at the very same time. We wanna thank all of you who participated last year and cooperated with us as we managed ourselves through that particular experience. And we're happy that a great many of you are back with us uh, on today. This conference continues to be a very important program of California State University Northridge. And Sandy, I wanna again, thank you for all of your great work and your team. And particularly this year, trying something new and different. And that is uh, hosting our conference in a virtual environment, our, our way of living these days. So I have uh, two very, uh, wonderful introductions that I get to provide this year. The first introduction uh, is uh, of our new president at California State University Northridge, Dr. Erica Beck. Uh, she began her tenure on uh, January 11th, so she is really still the newbie. She's engaged in her campus listening tour right now. She came to us from Cal State Channel Islands just north of us here, so she's very familiar with uh, our region. Uh, she's a strong advocate for the power of higher education to improve lives, transform communities, and promote social mobility. She's a native Californian, 
Uh, she has her bachelor's degree in psychology from UC San Diego, her master's in psychology from San Diego State, and her PhD in experimental psychology, again, from UC San Diego. She's a former researcher, has received a, a great many uh, awards and accolades for her uh, engagement in student uh, development and using data to improve student outcomes. But I think she would probably say the thing that she's proudest of are her two wonderful young boys that she has time to spend, uh, has some time with now when we're in a virtual environment. So if you would, please join me in welcoming through video our new president, Dr. Erica Beck. My warmest greetings. I am Erica Beck, president of California State University Northridge, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the 36th CSUN Assistive Technology Conference, the premier event in the field of technology for persons with disabilities. As an institution that is fiercely committed to advancing and advocating for equity, access, and inclusion, CSUN is proud to host this annual conference, which has transformed and improved the lives of people around the world for more than three and a half decades. It is part of our DNA to facilitate social mobility and to facilitate an equitable and inclusive campus environment. Our efforts encompass all facets of inclusivity, and we recognize that we need to continue to accelerate our work if we are to realize a society where everyone is able to participate, contribute, and thrive. This objective has always been at the heart of CSUN and this conference. Our virtual conference format this year gives us the opportunity to engage in a wider international audience, sharing the latest research related to assistive technologies and providing updates and thought-provoking conversations related to policy, inclusion, and more. While we miss the opportunity to connect face-to-face -face with friends and colleagues, in the same spirit of innovation and creativity that drives the advances showcased here every year, we have leveraged the unique benefits of technology that can bring people together from around the world in two-dimensional virtual spaces to broaden and make truly inclusive. Researchers, practitioners, educators, and persons with disabilities from around the world will be able to experience and participate in this year's conference and watch presentations and discussions on demand without having to travel long distances and choose between sessions. To kick off this year's conference, we are deeply honored to welcome as our keynote speaker, the Honorable Anthony Coelho, former six-term United States Congressman from California and the primary author and sponsor of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. Among the most significant achievements of civil rights legislation to be passed, which had just marked its 30th anniversary this past July. As many of you know, Congressman Coelho has been a lifelong champion for the rights of persons with disabilities based on his own personal experiences and journey. Following Congressman Coelho's keynote, we welcome you all to attend the live streamed feature presentations. You'll have the opportunity to hear from thought and policy leaders on topics like inclusion and how technology is being used to ensure people with disabilities are not excluded from relief in disaster situations, and of course, learn about the latest technological advances in assistive technologies. Please also ensure you visit the virtual exhibition hall to see the latest technology for persons with disabilities and interact with providers of assistive technology products and services in virtual booths. And of course, another highlight of the conference is the exciting science and research track sessions that will preview some of the work that will be featured in the ninth volume of the Journal of Technology and Persons with Disabilities later this spring. I want to express my deep appreciation for the generous support from our sponsors and guests, from US and international government agencies, research centers and universities, and the private sector who share our dedication to the mission and goals of this conference. This support is a reflection of the great community that exists to support and advance the work of ensuring inclusion for all. Thank you for joining us and for being engaged participants and for being champions of these discussions and the conference's mission to share knowledge, new innovations, best practices, and promote inclusion for all. Best wishes for a productive and enriching conference.
lives of people with disabilities. He calls this his ministry, while those in the disability community call him their voice and champion. Diagnosed with epilepsy when he was 22 years old, Mr. Coelho's ministry uh, is marked by significant milestones. The primary author and sponsor of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the most important piece of civil rights legislation in the last 30 years, advocating for the ratification of the UN Con uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and convincing President Bill Clinton to establish the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor. Mr. Coelho continued to advocate for civil rights for individuals with, the disabilities, with disabilities by convincing President Barack Obama to issue an executive order enforcing Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 requiring federal contractors and subcontractors to hire people with disabilities as they have been doing since 1973 for women and minorities. Mr. Coelho is a former six-term member of the United States Congress, first elected in 1978 and serving through 1989. He served on the Agriculture, Interior, Veterans Affairs, uh, and administration committees during his tenure, specializing in disability rights. In 1986, Mr. Coelho was elected House Majority Whip, the third most powerful position in the House of Representatives. After leaving Congress, Mr. Coelho joined wartime Schroeder and Company, uh, an investment banking firm in New York, where he served as a managing director uh, and then as president and CS, uh, CEO of Wertheim Schroeder Investment Services, a firm that he grew from 400 million to 4 billion in managing investments, pretty impressive. In 2018, Mr. Coelho founded the Coelho Center for Disability Law, Policy and Innovation at Loyola Marymount University, his alma mater. The Coelho Center will pursue a three-pronged mission, convening thought leaders to pursue positive change uh, on disability issues, leveraging technology to advance the lives of people with disabilities, and creating a pipeline of lawyers with disability disabilities to populate the bench and hold elected office. A native of California, Mr. Coelho earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in political science in 1964 from Loyola University uh, in LA, uh, now called Loyola, Loyola Marymount University, where he served as student body president. I see we have something in common there. Mr. Coelho has served as a member of Loyola Marymount University's Board of Trustees and received an honorary doctorate in 1987. Mr. Coelho currently serves uh, on the board of directors of both the Epilepsy Foundation and the American Association of Peoples with Disabilities, two boards he has previously chaired. Join me in welcoming our opening keynote speaker, Mr. Tony Coelho. Thank you, William. I uh, appreciate the introduction very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Sorry, it's not in person but with today's circumstances, we still get together. So it's great to, great to be with you. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about why I'm so active in disability issues, why I'm so committed. And as uh, William said, uh, my passion for disability and my ministry in effect. Uh, when I was uh, 16 years old, I had a uh, accident in the pickup truck on our farm, our dairy farm, and I hit my head. Uh, I was all right after this, uh, had a slight headache, but everything else was fine. And about a year later, I was in the barn milking uh, cows when I, all of a sudden I woke up and I was in my bed in the house and I had just had uh, what I called later pass, a passing out spell. The doctor told my parents that um, it was 
he thought, an epileptic seizure. Uh, my parents uh, didn't accept it because uh, they're Portuguese Americans, devout Catholics, and felt that if you have epilepsy, you're possessed by the devil. Now, I'll talk a little bit about these things through my comments, because those of us in the disability community, one of our biggest problems is that there is what we call stigma. People immediately assume because of X, you are Y. And so those of us in the disability community, that is something that we fight all the time. The, uh, my family uh, then took me to other doctors after that to try to find out if it was something other than epilepsy. Uh, of course, not telling me so. They just uh, went, ahead, uh, went ahead and did it. Now, the uh, three other doctors we went to basically said uh, the same thing. My parents always told me afterwards that it was a lack of calcium, it was something uh, different and so on. So uh, after the third doctor, uh, they decided to take me to a witch doctor. And uh, that's, you know, for a 17 year old, that's a little scary. Uh, you go into a room uh, that's dark with lit candles uh, they pour hot oil on your forehead and on your chest and, and pray in different tongues and so forth. Um, and then gets over with and supposedly the evil spirits disappear. Uh, I went to three witch doctors and none of the spirits disappeared because I kept on having these passing out spells. I then decided to go to uh, college in Los Angeles uh, somewhat to get away from Central California and these passing out spells and these attitudes and so forth. And I went to Loyola University, a Jesuit uh, college that most of you probably know there in Los Angeles. And uh, I, I loved it there. I was, uh, uh, I got to know everybody quite well, continued having these passing out spells uh, but it didn't make any difference. I would pass out and wake up and then continue doing what I, I needed to do. I, and during that period of time, um, I was determined to be a trial lawyer. And then John Kennedy got assassinated and I decided I got really, it really impacted me. And I talked a lot about it and decided then I wanted to do something more uh, public service to help out people because of uh, what John, John Kennedy uh, represented to me. And so at the end of my senior year, I was student, student by president, outstanding senior, all that stuff. And, and I decided to become a Catholic priest, to become a Jesuit. And uh, I always joked that my girlfriend of five years was a little surprised and my fraternity brothers knew better and so forth. But basically, uh, that's what I wanted to do. I went to my physical and the doctor said, uh, have you ever heard the word epilepsy? And I said, no. And he said, well, that's what you have. And he explained to me what it was. And then he said, I have some good news. It's 1964. And he said, uh, as a result of your epilepsy, you're 4F. And that's a term that uh, means that you can't serve in the military because of some condition. And mine, of course, being epilepsy. Well, I was pleased with that because uh, knowing that it, what it was, there was medication I could be given which would lessen the degree of the seizures or might even uh, eliminate some and so forth. So that was a positive for me. Uh, but then he said, the bad news is, is that um, the Catholic Church in 400 AD said, if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, um, you cannot be a priest. Um, stigma, again. And, but, you know, in my view, um, I had my mojo. I felt that um, that was fine. 
Uh, so I'll go out and get another job. And I had, you know, 80 <clears throat> or so different uh, job offers. So I would go to uh, fill out the application and, and hopefully get an interview. And I never got an interview because uh, on the application was the word epilepsy. And I always checked it. And so I didn't get an interview. After a while, I started to realize that I wasn't getting in the interviews because of my checking the box. And I realized that all of a sudden this epilepsy stuff was much more serious. And uh, I, when I called my parents to tell them what the doctor said, uh, my parents said, no son of ours has epilepsy, stigma. And so after a bit, I started drinking because I felt that everything I had ever loved in my life, my, Pam, my family, uh, my church, my God, so forth, had all of a sudden turned against me. And so I started drinking, was drunk by two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, some of you may know where Griffith Park is there in Los Angeles. And I would go there and, and drink. And when you're drinking, you think everything's bigger than otherwise. And so I thought I was on a mountaintop when actually it's, it was a hill. And at the bottom of that hill was a merry-go-round. And as I would drink out over day after day there and get drunk by two or three, um, the one day that I decided to uh, proceed with suicide, um, all of a sudden I heard a voice and it said, you're gonna be just like those little kids getting on and off the merry-go-round. You're never gonna let anybody or anything stop you from doing what you wanna do. Uh, as a result of that, uh, never been depressed again. I, I uh, drink, but I don't get drunk. Um, I got my mojo back. I felt uh, positive again. A week later, I got an opportunity to live with Bob Hope and his family. Uh, some of you are too young to know who Bob Hope is, very famous TV comedian um, in Los Angeles. Um, and Mr. Hope was fabulous to me, he was like a, like a father. Uh, and we had a lot of talks. And one day he said to me, he said, look, at, you think you have a ministry and it only can be practiced in a church. You're wrong. A true ministry is practiced in sports, entertainment, business, government, but where you belong is in politics. Well, I hadn't thought of that. And so after a while, uh, it sort of intrigued me. So I wrote a letter to my congressman who I didn't know. He happened to be at that time looking for somebody young with an agriculture background. And so I fit the bill, had an interview, got the job. I went back to Washington and I was sort of uh, the file clerk and ag expert and, and robo machine, which was uh, predecessor to computers and so forth. And, and I loved it. I just, uh, it, it really fit the bill as far as who I was, what I thought and so forth. Now, during this period of time, I continued to have my seizures, uh, but I knew what they were and my boss, the congressman, um, didn't have any trouble with me having a seizure because, uh, you know, once it was over, I could continue on doing what I was doing. I was committed at the time to try to make a difference in regards to what people with disabilities were going through. Um, then when he decided to retire, uh, he wanted me to take his place and I ran and was uh, easily elected. During the campaign, uh, my uh, opponent, uh, basically at one dinner party, said that, I don't know if you know it or not, but Tony's a very sick man. He has epilepsy. And what would you think if he went to the White House to argue a critical issue for us uh, and had a seizure? Well, uh, that night, the people at this dinner were very upset with that comment. Several of them called me uh, to say they were. Uh, the next day, I got a call from the reporter saying, I understand your opponent last night said X. What do you think about it? And my response was, well, 
in the 14 years I'd been a staffer in Washington, I knew a lot of people who went to the White House and had fits. At least I'd have an excuse. And that stopped. Nobody's ever taken me on my epilepsy since then. But again, stigma. So when I got elected, I decided that I wanted to get involved in doing things uh, besides uh, agriculture and water and so forth for my district in Central California. And so I got involved in offering amendments in regards to disability issues. And I realized that it really didn't make any difference what I offered because those of us with disabilities did not have our basic civil rights um, and that we had to fight for. It. And so I started working with uh, President Reagan and his team and coming up with some legislation. At the same time, there was a grassroots group primarily started at UC uh, Berkeley uh, that were advocating for uh, a civil rights bill. I didn't know it at that point, but uh, I started developing this and decided that we had to do something that was bipartisan and bicameral. So uh, selected a senator from Connecticut, Republican, who uh, uh, had a son uh, uh, with Downs and was very, interested in disabilities. And as a Democrat uh, in the House, then we were bicameral and bipartisan. And so when I introduced the bill, I had something like uh, 50 some co-sponsors. And what that means, I sent out a dear colleague letter and got people to say they wanted to sign up. The interesting thing was that as people read that letter, they would come up to me and say, Tony, um, I really wanna be active in in supporting your bill because I don't like the way my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, my next door neighbor is treated in regards to their disability. Now, quite honestly, most of them never read the bill or anything else, but they just didn't like the way people, people with disabilities were treated. This was at the end of the congressional session. So then the next uh, year we had to reintroduce it. And um, that time uh, I got together with the grassroots group and we modified the bill. <clears throat> and when I put it in, we got over 200 people, uh, members of Congress to co-sign the bill. And on the house side, uh, we were sort of pushed back by the leadership uh, because they thought the bill was way too expansive. The Senate side, it moved a lot easier uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, Senator Bob Dole, um, uh, Senator Tom Harkin, and Senator Orrin Hatch, the four of them, two Democrats, two Republicans, uh, all involved in some way with disabilities were the co-sponsors. And they led the effort there and it got through rather easily, as I said. On the House side, um, we had our 50 some people, then the 200 and so forth. And basically what we had to do to overcome the uh, leadership was basically I had to say I was gonna push ahead with it anyway. I had been elected uh, the majority whip. And so I felt I had some influence. And so I said, no, I was gonna push ahead with the bill. And then we developed a strategy to get it through uh, that uh, uh, with the seven different committees and 15 different subcommittees, then we got the, uh, the subcommittee that was the easiest to work on. Uh, and then went through each one by one by one to get it done. Ultimately, at one point, uh, the last committee was uh, public works and transportation. And Greyhound bus was the one that was fighting us the most. And they had spent a lot of money lobbying members of that committee. But we prevailed on a 21 to 20 vote uh, to get it through there. And then it went to the House floor and it easily passed. Signed into law by uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush. Uh, what people didn't know is that uh, he had a daughter who died of a disability at early age. So he was very pro doing something in regards to disabilities. Uh, he signed it over the objection of his chief of staff and others. Um, then the Supreme Court, after about 10 years, some cases went up to the Supreme Court regarding 
ADA and disability. The Supreme Court ruled that uh, ADA only applied to people with physical disabilities. And of course, that wasn't my intent. And so um, decided then that we would try to circumvent the Supreme Court. Um, basically, we introduced the ADA Amendments Act, which made it clear that the ADA applied to all disabilities. Um, now, that meant that we were overriding the Supreme Court, which is not se seldom done. Um, but we did, and it was pretty unanimous on both the House and the Senate side. So we got that through. It was signed by, incidentally, by uh, President George W. Bush, the son of, and he signed the Amendments Act. Now, an interesting couple stories that I'll tell you is that uh, uh, Papa Bush, uh, as I call him, um, had a granddaughter who uh, got married and I was invited to uh, the wedding. It was in uh, uh, his uh, um, uh, seaside home in New Hampshire. And uh, so there was a big tent and I was there and Papa Bush was in a wheelchair and he came rolling out. And when I saw him, I went over to say hello. And uh, so I, uh, he started to talk to me and he said, just think uh, a few years ago, uh, I signed the ADA and now I'm using it. And that was an interesting acceptance on his part of what he had done and what had happened and the impact that it had on, you know, millions of people. Uh, the other story I want to tell you is that uh, you might get an impression that I uh, was somewhat upset with the um, Catholic Church because of what I went through. And just for you to know, I'm a devout Catholic. Um, I, um, uh, when I was whip in the house, you get to make a trip uh, to three different countries and take a delegation with you. And my first trip, I decided that I wanted to go to Portugal, um, highest ranking Portuguese American ever in the history of the country. So that meant a state visit, red carpet, uh, state dinner, and speak to the parliament and all that great stuff. And so that was wonderful. Um, and then the State Department wanted me to go to, to Morocco and meet with the king because he was involved in, with Portugal in some negotiations on, on um, the Middle East. And so I was happy to do that. Some great stories about the visit with the king. But then I got to choose the third place. And the third place was the Vatican. And I wanted to meet with the Pope, Pope John Paul. And so they arranged for that. And uh, we get there, go into the Vatican. We sit down, the door opens, the Pope walks in, we stand up, we sit down and uh, I get up and go to the podium. Now I have a philosophy that whenever you have the podium, it doesn't have to be a wooden thing or a steel thing or whatever, but whenever you have control of the audience, uh, whatever it might be, that you should say what you really feel. You should speak particularly truth to power and not many people more powerful than a Pope. So I read the very boring pre-approved speech uh, that uh, the Vatican and the State Department had decided was what I should say. So I read that and it was really boring. Uh, got through with it and I said, your holiness, um, I could not live with myself if I didn't say something personal. <laughs> Minions around the room were kind of like, this is never done. You're not supposed to do that. Um, my delegation looked at me as if I were crazy. I hadn't told my wife or the delegation I was going to do this. I just was determined to do it. And I said, Your Holiness, um, as a young man, I decided to become a Catholic priest. I was denied entry because I have epilepsy. And canon law established in 400 AD said that if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, uh, you can't be a priest. I think that's very unchristian of our church, and I wish you'd look into it. I then sat down. He then gave his very boring pre-approved speech, 
Uh, we then took pictures afterwards, some great pictures, um, cost us $5 a photo, but we took a lot of them. And then it was time for him to leave. So as he was walking out, he was holding my wife's hand. He got to the door. He turned around and blessed her and then turned to me and did not bless me. Now, as a Catholic, when the Pope is, doesn't bless you, it means you're going straight down. Um, and I was uh, concerned about that, right? But he turned to me and he said, young man, I heard your comments and turned around and walked away. I was pleased that he said that he'd heard my comment, but I was concerned that he hadn't blessed me. Uh, but that was it. Uh, I felt good about what I did. And we then took off and the trip was a good trip. Two years later, canon law was changed to permit people with men, of course, uh, with epilepsy to become priests. Now, I'm very clear on this. I know what I did. There were witnesses and pictures and so forth, but I don't take credit for the change because I don't know if, if what I said made the difference. I just know what I did. And the reason I tell you this story is because I am a firm believer in speaking up to power and that you have to express yourself and so forth. And particularly those of us in the disability community that are always struggling to, to get our rights to, to be included and so forth. You gotta be willing to speak up and say what you think and so forth. And so I'm a big strong advocate of that and so on. And as I pointed out, one of the big problems that those of us in the disability community have is that people do not include us um, in jobs and anything else. I take the view uh, is that give us the right to fail. If you give us the right to fail, then we have an opportunity to succeed. But if we don't get that right, we can never succeed. Now, getting, us, getting across to people that we have abilities to do things has been difficult, stigma. Now, I, as a person with epilepsy, I still have seizures. I've had seizures for 60 years. Uh, just had a grand mal seizure a few weeks ago. Um, I can't do certain things. I can't uh, get a license to, to uh, be a pilot. Um, I can't drive uh, a police car, an ambulance, fire engine. Um, and there's a lot of restrictions on what I can and cannot do. But you know what? I know I can do some things better than anybody else. And that's what we have to believe as someone with a disability, but also what we have to convince other people is look at our abilities. Look at what we can do and how good we can be at it. And if we can't do it, fire us. I think that's the way it should be. We should be treated like anybody else. Give us the right to fail. And so that is something that I preach a lot and I'm very active in trying to make that happen. So I just want to make sure that um, all of you recognize that uh, stigma plays a huge role uh, in our acceptance or lack of acceptance. And at some point we got to get through it. And the way I know how to get through it is to speak up, is to acknowledge um, your disability when appropriate. I don't wear a neon light that says I have a disability, but I'm not afraid when the opportunity presents itself for me to say that I have a disability. And so I hope that all of you that are at this convention today um, realize that there are opportunities uh, to speak up when you see somebody that has a disability or when you hear somebody discriminating against somebody with a disability, or if you have a disability and that you are willing to speak up and educate, because that's the most important thing that we can do as individuals with a disability is to educate by example, but also by speaking up. 
uh, that we can make a difference in the life of people who have disabilities. So it's been an honor to be with you today. Uh, I hope that uh, your day goes extremely well today and so forth. I'm happy to be with you. Sorry again that I'm not with you in person, but I'm willing to answer any question that you might have about anything that I've done or have not done uh, or anything about disabilities. And look, it, uh, there's no question that's too personal. Uh, I've been in this business a long time and had lots of different questions. So let them come. Uh, so it's great to be with you again. It's time now to have some questions. Thank you, Tony. The first question that has come in today is from Wayne Todd. The not, here, the, the not hiring, excuse me, because of a disability is still going on. How do we start standing up against this? Well, thank you, Todd. Uh, the, that it does happen and there's no doubt about it. I always like to put things in perspective and that is that uh, people of color got their rights in the 60s, their civil rights. There's still problems uh, with people of color getting jobs and so forth. Women got their rights in the 70s, same thing. Gays got their rights in the 90s, same thing. We have to fight through that system just like anybody else. We've got to speak up and advocate. The ADA does not guarantee you anything except your right to be treated like everybody else. And that means you can take legal action in order to uh, go against somebody or a body or whatever and, and take that legal action. Also, it is very important who becomes president of the United States because they appoint the attorney general who appoints the head of the civil rights division in the Justice Department. The Justice Department is the one who enforces the ADA. And so if, if there is a body uh, like a company or a university or, or whatever that is violating the ADA, they can take action. If there's a group of people that are violating the ADA, they can take action and do. And, and as a result of the ADA, there has been a lot of enforcement, uh, like for example, you can go to any street corner and you see the curb cuts and that's there for people with uh, a physical disability. But who uses it? It's uh, mothers and fathers with their babies in, in strollers. It's delivery men and women going to the stores on that street uh, and the elderly in order to get on the sidewalk. And then young kids with their skateboards and so forth and so on use it. Uh, so a lot of these accommodations are used by the general public. But if you are, been, are discriminated against, you have a right to file action. Uh, and that's the way it works. We cannot um, mandate under, under civil rights law a number of jobs or whatever. That is separate uh, legislation. But you have a right legally to sue if you're being discriminated against. That's the big difference uh, that has taken place. And of course that happens and results sometimes are, are very positive. Thank you. Another question is from Athel. Could the ADA be passed in 2021? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the answer I honestly believe is no that um, uh, when we adopted it and, and uh, it was a situation at the time in 1990 that there was a lot of bipartisanship. Uh, people worked together to solve problems. And uh, in the last Congress, there was an attempt on the part of the House of Representatives uh, to uh, amend the ADA to basically gut it it passed the House by a small margin and got killed in the Senate, thank God. Um, it's not gonna happen in this Congress. But my concern is if, that, if we opened up the ADA for any amendments, uh, the odds of us getting that done today uh, would probably be remote. Uh, so it's, a, it's 
I, I really aggressively oppose any attempt to amend the ADA at this time. Um, and that's sad to say, um, but uh, it is the circumstances. And so what we try to do is make sure that the law is enforced, uh, that uh, we get somebody at the Justice Department and the Civil Rights Division who is aggressively uh, pushing the enforcement of the ADA. And that's where we'll make our progress. Thank you. Sonia has asked, how could technology leaders make a difference to make technology more inclusive for people with disabilities? That's a great question. Um, see, I, I'm very involved in that right now in that there's a group that does an analysis of the internet and websites, and they come out with a report every six months. And it's not a, a government group, it's uh, a, an independent group. And their last report said that 98.8%, that's 98.8, 98% of all websites are not accessible, are not accessible. So that means that a lot of us with disabilities uh, don't have an opportunity to use the internet or it's too clumsy to use it, whatever. And so uh, there was a pizza company who decided that they weren't going to comply um, with ADA because they felt that uh, the ADA did not cover uh, the internet. And I, you know, because the internet wasn't there when we passed it, uh, the ADA. And I take the view that uh, the ADA involves interstate commerce, and so forth. And I feel that the internet is the highway in technology. And so in my view, the ADA does cover the internet. Well, the pizza company uh, uh, went against it and the lower courts ruled against them. They appealed it to the appellate court. Uh, the appellate court ruled it against them. Then they appealed to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decision uh, last fall was that they accepted the decision of the appellate court. So that in effect said, Supreme Court said that the ADA does cover the internet. So now it's an effort to uh, enforce the law. And that's, I'm excited in that uh, I think we will get, uh, I, I know an attorney general who believes in the ADA, we have that, uh, he'll be approved or uh, confirmed by the Senate probably this week. But then the appointment of who's going to head up the civil rights division, um, uh, we're working on that, trying to make sure the right person gets there, uh, that then to get the Justice Department to enforce the law in regards to internet access. Uh, as you can imagine, those of us with disabilities, uh, the internet's critical for us to uh, be involved in commerce. Look at during this epidemic right now, how many of you use the internet? Because uh, that's really the only way to get a lot of things done. Um, but those of us with disabilities for lots of different reasons, uh, it's not accessible and we can't use it. And so to get over this milestone, it's gonna happen uh, in my view in these two years and uh, we'll get that uh, enforced and we'll start to make a difference. There are companies today that provide that uh, help to, to different uh, uh, companies and groups and so forth. So now it's just making sure that they everybody realizes uh, they have to be accessible. So we've made progress. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Thank you. Kevin would like to know, what's your nugget words of wisdom or the one thing you wish the younger you knew? That the younger I, if I knew when I was younger? Yes. Um, I would say that, well, I, I guess, I wish that uh, the whole stigma was not there. Um, and it's hurt so many people. Um, 
it um, it hurt me um, and that I was suicidal as I indicated, but it also hurt me with, uh, with my family, uh, my parents not accepting my disability and uh, basically not wanting me to uh, participate in public events where I might have a seizure in public and then uh, uh, they felt that God was punishing me uh, because somebody in the family, not necessarily me, but somebody in the family committed a major sin and that God was letting everybody know that that family uh, had done that. And that stigma um, still sticks with me because of what my parents did. And a, a quick personal story on this is that when my mother died, um, I was, um, uh, I went to the services, of course, and to the burial. And as um, her body was being lowered into the ground, uh, something came over me and said that you have to decide, uh, do you love her or do you respect her? You can't, can't be both. And I decided that uh, I loved her because everything that she did um, was out of love wasn't out of uh, spite or anything else. It's what she believed. But I didn't respect her because of what she did um, to me. And I immediately had uh, a seizure there in the cemetery. Um, and so that scar tissue stays with you. You can't, um, you can't get rid of it. Uh, and so I wish that um, uh, this type of thing uh, was not there for me it's still there for a lot of other people. And I wish that weren't the case um, because of what people have to end up going through. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Stephanie would like to know how many years did it take to see the ADA from conception to a signed bill, meaning the process of deciding you wanted to make a difference and then seeing the bill signed into law? Well, actually, that's a good question in that it was quick um, and that most civil rights laws take uh, some time. Uh, but uh, I, I think the right dates is that I uh, introduced it in late um, uh, 86 and it was signed into law in July of uh, 1990. And so that's sort of a, a record in regards to uh, a significant uh, disability, excuse me, a significant civil rights bill. And, uh, and of course, disability, but um, it went quickly. And, and I think the reason was, is that it was bipartisan, bicameral. But in the Senate, we had uh, Senator Kennedy, who was kind of the lion of the, the Senate, but had a family with uh, several kinds of different disabilities. Bob Dole um, was a, a man who got injured in the war, couldn't use his left hand. Uh, left arm. And so he understood disability, was adamant about it. Tom Harkin was uh, a senator from Iowa who brother uh, had uh, a hearing loss. And so he did sign language and he understood what his brother was going through and so forth. And then Senator Harkin from Utah, a Republican, what uh, is still a Mormon, and the Mormon church really was very supportive of individuals with disabilities. So the four of them, uh, two Republicans, two Democrats, got it through rather quickly just because their leadership uh, provided for it and it was bipartisan. On the House side, you had me that I had a disability and I was in the leadership. And um, I got uh, the uh, Republicans to appoint somebody to lead the effort and when I left the Congress, um, Steny Hoyer of Maryland um, became the lead Democrat. And so again, we had uh, people together, but when I left, we already had over 200 people uh, supporting it and, and the process went on. So it was a question of having people with disabilities, and I stress that, in elected office who were arguing aggressively for it and these individuals were in position of influence. 
And so it moved. Um, and the public generally felt very strongly that people with disabilities were not treated fairly. Um, so uh, it went through rapidly and is now the law of the land, not only in the United States, but over 50 different countries throughout the world. So we've exported something great. Thank you. Uh, Nandita has asked, what can we all do in our own individual roles within technology to become better allies and advocates for accessibility? Thank you very much. Um, I think it's important to make sure that uh, when you see that in technology that something is not accessible or you know of something that you speak up about it, uh, let the company know. There are ways to make everything accessible now. And so there's no reason that a site um, should not be accessible. So to speak up about it. And uh, I really believe strongly that in this two year period, uh, you're gonna have uh, legal enforcement uh, of the ADA and technology. But for individuals, speak up, uh, help us, uh, make sure that uh, they're accessible. Um, as I said earlier, uh, it's, I think it's critically important for those of us with disabilities, but those of you that understand uh, disability and so forth, for you to speak up, uh, not to sit back and just take it. When there's a problem or something is not fair, uh, you should speak up and try to get it changed. Thank you. Daniel would like to know, what's the best advice that you can give to those of us who advocate for equity in technology in the federal space, the federal government space? Well, I think there, uh, again, it's uh, the ADA is a federal law. Uh, the Supreme Court has ruled that the internet has to be accessible. And I think that it's uh, important for you as an individual uh, to um, ask why it's not accessible and that say, if, if it's appropriate, say that the ADA does cover it and that it uh, has to be accessible. Um, I think that it's an education process at this point because I think most of these companies uh, don't realize that the law does cover them. And so uh, by you speaking up and saying something and saying that uh, the ADA does cover the internet, uh, you be educating that company or that individual as to what really is the law today. And, and they can check it out and it is. Uh, so uh, I think that's the best way of doing it. Okay, we have a question that came in anonymously and it is, how can you still believe in the Catholic Church when they treated you so badly? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, I understand that. Uh, the, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very uh, religious. Um, I don't believe in everything that Catholic Church preaches, um, but I believe in, in a spiritual being. being. And uh, I disagree with the church in some areas. I agree with the church in most areas. Um, and I believe it's a, a, a learning process. It's a teaching process. And um, I spoke to power uh, because I felt strongly about what the church was doing. Um, I had no reservations in doing it. Um, and uh, so I, I, I will say something that you know, I realize that uh, the, the church hierarchy is uh, made up of men. And, and I take the view that, you know, we as men don't have the answers to everything. And so I believe that there can be mistakes as there was in regards to uh, disabilities, um, uh, epilepsy. Uh, but the current Pope is a strong advocate of disabilities. And, um, and has shown it in every possible way. And so I, I you know, look at the government was not uh, favorable to uh, disabilities. Uh, and what I did was to fight 
to make the government uh, uh, accessible and, and knowledgeable and so forth. I still fight today uh, to get uh, the government to do the right thing on disabilities. I fight uh, presidential candidates to talk about disabilities. Um, I have fought uh, the last five presidents in regards to making sure that disability was included in, in everything that they do. I'm currently working with this administration and trying to get people with disabilities hired in uh, governmental jobs, because I think we have to be part of the process. And I think that if we're not part of the process, then we can't get things done. For example, um, I'm thrilled that um, uh, President Biden acknowledges um, his disability. He's a stutterer. And if you listen to him speak at times, he will change the subject, change the word quickly, because that's what stutters are taught in order to keep uh, speaking. Some people misinterpret that, that there's something wrong with him. Um, he's president of the United States. He was a senator for uh, uh, a record number of years, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, vice president of the United States. He can do things better than a lot of other people. There are certain things that he has a problem with. And so I believe that's the case um, all over. So the fact that the church, uh, in my view, discriminated against me, um, uh, I take as a blessing because if I didn't have my epilepsy, um, I don't think I'd be as strong a person as I am today. Um, I had to fight and I think that makes you a better person. So um, I openly say, I thank God for my epilepsy uh, because I am the person I am today because of it. Thank you. Mary has asked, I'm a vocational rehab counselor. Many people who are blind cannot independently apply for online jobs or complete the online tests. And many companies require that their application process is online. This is not accessible to screen reading software like JAWS. This means that the individual has to disclose the disability to their human resources person um, in order to apply. Isn't this illegal? How should we handle and move forward? Well, it was basically questionable before last fall. Now the Supreme Court has ruled uh, that the internet has to be accessible. Corporations, their websites have to be accessible. So now it's a question of uh, getting that enforced. And so having the Justice Department go after uh, companies and so forth that aren't complying with the ADA is where we have to be now. So uh, my advice is that, yes, that was an issue that was questionable and internet, the internet companies and organizations uh, could say, well, there's no requirement that they do it. Now, as a result of the Supreme Court decision to uphold the appellate court decision means that the ADA does cover the internet and that the internet has to be uh, accessible. So that is a process that we've got to go through now in educating. And part of the education is having lawsuits filed against companies that aren't compliant so that it starts to, to happen. Um, that's the process, but I'm really pleased that we finally got that Supreme Court decision. We were talking about trying to do legislation to make it clear, uh, but uh, as I said earlier, uh, the concern was, was opening up the ADA and that you might get uh, uh, some negative amendments. Um, but now the courts have ruled, so that helps us in moving forward. Thank you. Rachel has asked, do you have advice for companies who treat accessibility repair requests as extra requests or special feature requests when it's simply a repair for compliance? Well, that's a great question because I'm a huge believer that there is uh, nothing uh, that is extra, is that we as a disabled person have the right, the legal right, to be able to participate 
and society just like anybody else. And that is the law of the land. And uh, you can't discriminate against us because of it. And so uh, it's true, as women can tell you, that over the years, uh, there have been uh, situations where women couldn't own, couldn't own property, couldn't do jobs. But as a result of the enforcement of the law, that has all changed now. And that uh, uh, women can be involved and are treated equally um, along with men in most cases. Um, uh, there are still problems in that regard. In regards to disabilities, we still have problems. We still have the stigma that I talk about where companies will discriminate against us. When that happens, uh, you have to be willing to uh, uh, disclose it to the Justice Department uh, and there is of course through the states and so forth, but to disclose it uh, and then action can be taken. Uh, it's an enforcement of the ADA that is required here, but now with this uh, Supreme Court decision, it, uh, we will be treated uh, just like everybody else or should be treated just like everybody else. Thank you. Mary asks, many state jobs as well as other companies require a driver's license even when the job description does not require driving. I think companies are weeding out people with DUIs and those with bad driving records, et cetera, but many applicants with disabilities do not drive and are simply left out of those jobs. How is this legal and how can we get it changed? No, that's a great question. I've never had that question before. Um, uh, I think, I have to think about that, but uh, I think that uh, there should be some type of identification. I understand that, um, but it shouldn't be a driver's license. I mean, that's the situation like with voting. It used to be you had to have a driver's license. You no longer have to, uh, that's the law. Um, so uh, that's one I'm gonna mark down. I'm gonna check that out and see uh, if that is illegal. It seems to me it is. Uh, but I can't give you a direct answer at this point. I'm sorry. Thank you. Crystal has asked, how important is it for people with disabilities to remain flexible and innovative when dealing with things that are not fully accessible? And if we are flexible, do you feel it gives companies a way out of becoming fully accessible? Well, <laughs> That's another good question because I think it comes down to um, us understanding what the job is and whether or not we can or cannot do it. If we can do it, no matter how we can do it, uh, then there should be uh, no question about what we're doing or not doing. Um, I think that we, we got to be careful of is that we don't use an excuse uh, not to do something uh, just because we don't want to do it. Uh, and so that if you take a job, then you got to be willing to do the job. Um, I am very strong on this and that uh, I have uh, no pity and that I think that if you take a job, you should do it and there should be accommodations to make sure you can do it. I'm, all insistent upon that. But if you can't do the job, then you should move on to another job. That's what everybody else has to do. And I don't wanna be treated any differently than somebody else. I want the same rights. I want the same opportunities to do the job. Uh, but if I can't do it, like I said earlier, I can't drive an ambulance or, or a, a police car or whatever. I understand all that. But I sure in the hell can do a lot of things just like anybody else. And I want to be given that right to do it. Thank you. Mohammed has asked how we, meet, how we may further the US government's efforts for advancing the accessibility, particularly with people with neurological disorders. Uh, another good, good question. Um, I, I just, 
I have to think that one through, but I, it would seem to me that I go back to my premise. And that is, um, if you can do the job, uh, you should not be discriminated against no matter what your condition is. The question is, can you do the job? Um, and as I've indicated uh, several times now, there are certain things I can't do. And I understand that and I accept it. Uh, but as I say to you, um, I've proven that I can be very successful in a lot of different areas, more successful than some people who don't have a disability. I don't mind saying that. And so it's whether or not you can do the job. If you can do the job, then there should be no discrimination. And um, I strongly support that right. Thank you so much. Um, there are a lot of kudos coming in for you on the question feed. So I just want to let you know that a lot of people are saying that how amazing you are and thanking you for all of the hard work that you've done. And uh, one of our final questions um, is, uh, do you feel that accessibility, specifically in web technology, is overlooked uh, compared to design fields? Is design more important than accessibility? Well, I totally agree. I mean, I totally agree because what should happen in technology is that accessibility should be in the design stage as opposed to an accommodation. And that I applaud Apple, for instance, uh, because a lot of their accessibility is included in Apple products. Um, and that's the way it should be at all times. So that when you're designing something, you should make sure that it's accessible to everybody. And in the design stage, it's cheaper, it's easier, and so forth if it's done there. So that's a great question. And it's something that I keep pushing all the time as don't, when you talk about the need for accommodations, I say, but did you do it in the design stage or did you leave us out in the design stage? If you left us out, that's your problem and you have to provide for the accommodation. But if you have companies like Apple and others, Microsoft does some of it as well, but if you have companies that are determined that in when they're designing something, particularly in the internet, and they're designing something that it should be accessible to all of us, that's where it needs to be. Thank you so much, Tony. Lots of encouraging remarks on here. I'm gonna send them to you so you can read them. Thank you for sharing your story with us. It was amazing. Uh, and here. Welcome back, Sandy. Thank, thank you, you Ashley, for your comments. And thank you, everybody that uh, has made your comments to me. I, uh, I really love the fact that uh, you had me today and that you're willing to listen to what needs to be done and so forth. So I applaud you and thank you. Everybody have a good day. Thank you, Tony, for sharing your story with us. It was especially inspiring hearing it directly from you. And thanks to everyone who participated in the Q&A, which is actually a benefit of being virtual. That's it was right. really fun and we haven't done it before. And we got to hear more about your experience and insight. So it was really great. Thank you to Dr. Watkins and Dr. Beck also. Before we close out the program, I did want to acknowledge some important partners. A big thanks to Jenison Asuncion, Program Chair for the General Track Sessions, and Dr. Klaus Miesenberger, Program Chair of the Journal Track and the Scientific Editor for the Journal on Technology and Persons with Disabilities. As a reminder, a draft version of the ninth edition is posted on the website, so you can review it before you go to the journal sessions. The final edition will be published in the spring. As always, a shout out to our sponsors, Amazon, Google, Oracle, the US intelligence community, and Vispero. Their contributions on top of the support from exhibitors, presenters, and attendees keeps the conference and the Center on Disabilities going. And this year, trust me, it was very much needed and appreciated more than ever. One last thing, I just wanna call your attention to a few conference activities that may be new or a little different this year. And all of this is on the website. First, don't forget the exhibit hall is opening this afternoon at one o'clock. 
and runs through Saturday, but check the schedule for the daily hours. And join us at 8 a.m. tomorrow, Thursday and Friday for our live streaming and open to the public featured presentations with the U.S. Access Board, GADRA, and the U.S. Intelligence Community. You can submit questions for these up until 6 p.m. the night before each presentation. After these, at 9 a.m., the links will open to the block of recorded sessions premiering that day. Today only, the session block opens at 10 a.m. And remember that we have a selection of daily sessions which are followed by a live Q&A. These are, will be shown at specific times. After that, the recorded presentations will be available for viewing. And some good news, I'm excited to tell you that we've been able to extend the deadline to access all re recorded content another week. So you now have until 5 p.m. Sunday, March 21st. I think that's it for now. Thanks to all for joining us this year and participating in the 2021 CSUN AT conference. We really miss seeing everyone and hope that you come back in 2020, 2022 and you're all vaccinated. When we are planning, fingers crossed, on being back in Anaheim. I think we're all more than ready to get back to some good old times. So enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you.